Welcome to Renegade Inc. The catastrophe dubbed the Amazon Chernobyl is probably the biggest oil disaster you've never heard of. Between 1964 and 1992, the oil company Texaco, later acquired by Chevron, was allegedly responsible for dumping over 30 billion gallons of toxic waste and crude oil into the Amazon rainforest in Ecuador. The impact on local communities has been devastating, destroying livelihoods and causing a spike in cancer and birth defects. Stephen Donzinger was the lead US attorney for the indigenous plaintiffs of Ecuador in a class action that began in 1993. In February 2011, an Ecuadorian court issued a historic ruling ordering Chevron Texco to pay almost $10 billion. Chevron considered the ruling illegitimate and inapplicable, and then moved all their assets out of Ecuador. In the same year, they filed a civil racketeering suit in New York City against the lawyer Stephen Donzinger, which is where the plot thickens. The judge assigned to the case was US District Judge Lewis Kaplan, and in 2014, he ruled that the judgment in Ecuador was invalid, claiming Donzinger had achieved the result through, quote, fraud, bribery, and corruption. In 2020, Donzinger was disbarred in New York, but not in the District of Columbia, where he is also a bar member. He denies all the allegations and appealed the verdict, considering the attack on his law license to be politically motivated in retaliation for his successful human rights work in Ecuador. Before we speak to Stephen, it's important to note that as part of the appeals process, Judge Kaplan ordered him to surrender his computer, phones and other electronic devices to Chevron. Donzinger refused and appealed the order, arguing that this would violate the attorney-client privilege. Whilst his appeal against the order was pending, Judge Kaplan charged him with six counts of criminal contempt of court. Mr Donzinger is currently under house arrest in his apartment in New York. His trial has been postponed several times and is now scheduled for May the 10th. To date, the Ecuadorian plaintiffs have not received any compensation from Chevron for the Amazon Chernobyl. Stephen Donziger, thank you very much for joining us here on Renegade Inc. Thank you for having me. Looking at your case and reading the case notes uh, and looking at the story that surrounds it, uh, to put it bluntly, it makes the Erin Brockovich story look like a tame episode of Judge Judy. Uh, can you tell a UK audience uh, the facts around the story and how you are sitting in Manhattan at the moment under house arrest? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, you know, in a nutshell, this case concerns the world's worst oil-related disaster on Earth. Not enough people have heard about it happened in Ecuador in the Amazon rainforest starting in the mid-1960s when an American company called Texaco, now Chevron, went into this pristine rainforest and secured the rights from the military government to drill over an enormous 1,500 square mile area of rainforest where several indigenous groups were living and had been living prosperously for millennia. And what Texaco, now Chevron, then proceeded to do was grotesque and in our opinion, criminal. They designed a system of oil extraction that had as its fundamental feature the systematic discharge on a daily basis of millions of gallons of cancer-causing toxic waste into rivers and streams that the local communities relied on for their drinking water, for their bathing, for their fishing, for their very survival. And over a period of time, many people died of cancer. They continue to die. There's a thousand open air toxic waste pits that Chevron built that run their cancer causing effluent into rivers and streams to this day. Chevron left Ecuador in the early 1990s and we filed a lawsuit. I'm a lawyer, a group of us filed a lawsuit on behalf of 
the communities that were affected. And in a nutshell, um, over many years, we ended up winning the lawsuit in Ecuadorian courts where Chevron had insisted the trial take place and where Chevron had accepted jurisdiction. As the evidence mounted against the company, they knew they would lose. They started attacking Ecuador's court system. They started attacking the lawyers who brought the case, including me, attacked community leaders. And in a nutshell, we won the case big. Uh, there's a about a $10 billion judgment, which by the way, that might sound like a lot. It's a modest number compared to the magnitude of the damage. And it's a fraction, for example, of what British Petroleum has paid for its Deepwater Horizon disaster in the United States. But in any event, it's a sizable number. And then Chevron sued me back in U.S. courts where I live here in New York. They sued They named as defendants all the community leaders, other lawyers, scientific consultants. And they ran what was essentially a show trial without a jury um, presided over by a judge who's a former tobacco industry lawyer who would not look at any of the evidence from the Ecuador case, would not look voluminous scientific evidence that backed the judgment in Ecuador, which has been affirmed by multiple appellate courts. And he found, based on a paid witness, Chevron paid a witness $2 million, that I, that I orchestrated the bribery of the trial judge in Ecuador in order to win the case, which is something that's completely false. It's been rejected by 29 different appellate judges in Ecuador and Canada um, who've looked at it. But it was used to attack me and tried to block enforcement of the judgment against Chevron's assets. And as part of that process, Chevron demanded that I turn over my computer and cell phone to the company so they could spy on our operations and our, you know, various enforcement actions. Um, My ethical obligations, my legal obligations prevented me from doing that. So I appealed Judge Kaplan's, the judge's name is Lewis Kaplan. I appealed his order. It's still under appeal. And while it was under appeal, He charged me with criminal contempt of court and had me locked up in my house where I've been for now 16 months at the time of this interview. So, you know, in our view, this is politically motivated corporate attack by a major oil company and a judge who is sympathetic and wants to punish me and I think really punish send an intimidating message to all human rights lawyers and advocates who want to take on the fossil fuel industry. You mentioned uh, Judge Kaplan. He has publicly stated that he feels that Chevron is a company of considerable importance to our economy that employs thousands all over the world, that supplies a group of commodities, gasoline, heating oil, other fuels and lubricants on which every one of us depends every single day. Judge Kaplan's a former corporate lawyer turned judge. Uh, Is it the case that he uh, has a soft spot for the corporate world? Uh, is uh, Is that fair to say? I think it is. I mean, look, judges come in all shapes and sizes. I mean, my, my, my complaint is not that I think a judge should absolutely agree with our position. I mean, what judges need to do is do their jobs correctly, which is be neutral, look at the facts, apply the law, and, and make sound decisions that are, you know, backed by reason. And I think in this case, Judge Kaplan let his emotions get the best of him. For example, in our case, first of all, he never should have taken the case when Chevron sued me. I mean, the case had been in Ecuador, and those were the courts where Chevron had wanted the case to be decided, and they decided it against Chevron. And a corporation shouldn't be able to get a second bite at the apital by going back to its home country courts and finding a sympathetic judge to somehow come up with a ruling that attacks a, you know, high court judgment from another country, a sovereign country, which is what Judge Kaplan did. So, you know, Judge Kaplan, for example, wouldn't look at the Ecuador judgment. He wouldn't look at the evidence in Ecuador. He just decided he was going to exclude all that, which clearly supported the judgment against Chevron. And he was just going to rule based on evidence from a guy named Alberto Guerra, who's a witness from Ecuador to whom Chevron paid $2 million to come up and lie about this supposed bribe. I mean, no judge in his or her right mind should only look at a teeny part of the evidence, in this case, corrupt, what we believe is corrupt evidence. It's been rejected by 29 appellate judges, you know, in Ecuador and Canada. So, 
Yes, I do think Judge Kaplan had a soft spot. I think the quote you read is an example of that. I mean, what's the point of that quote? To say that just because a company is so big and important, it shouldn't be allowed to be held accountable for human rights violations? I mean, you know, it's, it's preposterous. It hurts personally, but it, what it really is is a broader attack on the whole idea of human rights lawyering, corporate accountability, and environmental justice. And, you know, without this work, we're not going to have a planet soon. I mean, you know, being able to do this kind of accountability work to hold the polluters accountable is critically important to the survival of the planet. So, you know, this case is a flashpoint on some of the most important issues facing our world today. And I do believe Judge Kaplan should be removed from the case and it should be reassigned to a neutral judge for sure. Another uh, renowned human rights lawyer, Martin Garbus, says this is the first case I have seen where a judge let a private corporation take over the prosecutorial power of the US government to silence a critic. That's quite a statement. Yeah, and let me tell you what I think Mr. Garbus means by that. And by the way, for those who don't know, Marty Garbus has practiced law for 60 years. He's represented Nelson Mandela, Cesar Chavez, Daniel Ellsberg, some of the most important, you know, figures um, who fought for social justice in, in world and U.S. history. I mean, Marty is an incredible lawyer. So for him to say that means something. And what he means, I think, is this. When Judge Kaplan charged me criminally, you know, the charging power in a civilized society comes from a prosecutor's office. In Latin America, it's called the fiscal. In England, you have prosecutors who bring cases. What happened in this case is Kaplan was, had such a, in my view, such a personal vendetta against me. He charged me as a judge. Judges don't charge crimes. They preside over cases. So, when Kaplan charged me, he was obligated by law to take his contempt charges to the normal federal prosecutor's office called the SDNY, that's the office in New York. And that office notably rejected his charges. They refused to prosecute me. And I believe they did so because I believe these charges are baseless. Like no one's ever been charged for criminal contempt for what I did, which was basically protecting my clients and challenging orders that I believe were unlawful on appeal. So when they rejected the charges, Kaplan then appointed a private law firm to prosecute me in the name of the government. So I'm not being prosecuted by the government, I'm being prosecuted privately in the name of the government. The law firm is called Seward and Kissel, and they have none other than Chevron as a client, as well as many major oil and gas entities. So when Marty says this is the first time I've seen this, no one has seen this. You know, that I am being prosecuted in the name of the government by Chevron, by Chevron lawyers from a Chevron law firm, and they have locked me up. Now, I believe that not only would a normal prosecutor never have charged this case, because we, we know that, they rejected it, but even if they had, they wouldn't lock me up. I mean, there's not a single person in America charged with what's called a misdemeanor offense. It's a petty crime with a maximum sentence of six months, which is my criminal contempt. It's a petty misdemeanor offense who has spent even a minute or a day in any kind of pretrial home confinement. And I've been here 16 months. Stephen, in that first half, a uh, uh, very high level, you've uh, really descriptively uh, shown us what's going on with you, your case, your house arrest, and the fact that uh, it could be the case that the judiciary in the US uh, looks favorably at corporate interests over the interests of human rights and the environment. When you were first told that uh, house arrest was going to happen, Judge Loretta Preska enacted the uh, proceedings. What was your uh, reaction? Having won the lawsuit, almost $10 billion uh, in Ecuador, what was your reaction to her judgment that you were going to be incarcerated uh, in your own apartment? I was shocked. Um, I really 
did not expect it. It never, that kind of thing had never happened before in our country's history. It became very clear to me that day in court, which was August 6, 2019, that this was just a setup. And there was nothing, I, at least on that day, that I could do about it. I did not have a lawyer. I mean, I walked in to ask for more time because this was a very sudden kind of thing and I had to hire a lawyer to help me. And even without a lawyer, she just put a slapped an ankle bracelet on me and posed an $800,000 bond, um, which by the way is highly unusual for a misdemeanor case. I'd say it's unprecedented as well. So it's like the double whammy. And I almost ended up in jail because I couldn't get the $800,000 to post for various reasons. And ultimately a supporter of mine posted it and that allowed me the ability to stay in my home with an ankle bracelet and be detained here as opposed to an actual prison. When it comes to uh, Chevron and their strategy, uh, what is their strategy? Because when you start to read about what's happened to you, it's clear that there's a sort of punishment angle here that goes on. I mean, just some of the things that uh, hired private investigators to track you. Um, they've created uh, publications to smear you. Um, they've, you've been disbarred. Uh, your bank accounts have been frozen. You have been prohibited from earning money. Is this all part of the demonization uh, of, of the or character assassination, which ultimately comes down to a strategic play, which is play the man, not the ball? Well, look, you know, if you're a corporation that's caught stone cold dumping billions of gallons of cancer causing toxic waste into the Amazon and killing off indigenous nations, and you don't want to meet your responsibilities, you're going to look for some way to distract people's attention for your, from your crime. And I think that Chevron, when they looked at the landscape of the case, they determined that their best bet to avoid paying this judgment was to make it about the lawyers and specifically about me. So they made up evidence and paid this witness to tell this tall lie in, in a U.S. court. They found the right judge. I mean, this wasn't an accident. It didn't just happen to land in Judge Kaplan's courtroom. They directed it to him. And they launched a campaign, laundered through the credibility of the federal judiciary to demonize me. Um, we have an email from 2009, actually, from the Chevron consultant who admits, I mean, this is a group email, a bunch of Chevron officials saying, our LT, meaning long-term strategy, is to demonize Donziger. This is back in 2009. So this strategy was created over a decade ago and has been implemented for the last decade. The other thing they said is they threatened the indigenous peoples of Ecuador with what they call a lifetime of mitigation if they didn't drop the case. So if you have their lifetime of litigation threat, you have their demonization threat, and that's exactly what we're watching happen now as it plays out. I just wanna take you back to one point you made, which is you said a witness uh, lied. Can you give me evidence, factual evidence, that this witness lied in your case? Absolutely, he admitted it himself, but the, the fundamental facts are these. He came into court and alleged that I had bribed a, a trial judge or approved a bribe of a trial judge in Ecuador. He offered no corroborating evidence to that at all. They had all my emails. There was no email communication between me and the judge. I'd never met the judge. I had no contact with the judge. It was all just a big fat lie. And we have evidence that this witness had been coached for 53 consecutive days by Chevron's lawyers prior to his testimony. Subsequent to his testimony, um, in a separate arbitration proceeding, he testified under oath that he had lied repeatedly before Judge Kaplan when he accused me of approving a bribe. And what was the outcome of that admission? Well, nothing. I mean, because Judge Kaplan, even though we submitted it to the court in New York, Judge Kaplan never changed his opinion. He never did anything. But what it did do is it buttressed the judgments out of these other courts who have rejected Judge Kaplan's decision. And it's very important for people to understand that Judge Kaplan rejected all the evidence, 64,000 chemical sampling results, over 100 technical evidentiary reports that we had submitted in the Ecuador case as evidence against Chevron, wouldn't even look at it yet accepted testimony from this one man who had been paid massive sums of money from Chevron. That's not in dispute. Chevron gave us the contract, gave him, moved him to the United States, moved his family to the United States. He'd been making $500 a month in Ecuador. 
He was paid $12,000 a month in the United States by Chevron to basically be a professional witness. He was given health insurance, a car, his income taxes were paid. He was given independent lawyers that Chevron paid for. And we believe this is still going on today, years later. You know, he's still living here on Chevron's payroll. That kind of witness has no credibility. If the strategy from the corporate entity here, which is Chevron, is to demonize you and thus create a chilling effect, similar with Julian Assange in Belmarsh here in the UK, create a chilling effect. So anybody else who thinks to go and do um, human rights work at the level that you're working at thinks twice about getting involved because they know ultimately the price that they pay uh, isn't dissimilar to the price that you're paying. If that is the strategy, these slap lawsuits, we haven't heard about them in the UK. What is a slap lawsuit and why are, are they in, in existence? So a slap lawsuit is a lawsuit filed by a powerful entity like a corporation, in this case Chevron, or some governmental entity or some wealthy individual that's designed not to litigate any claims really on the merits or it's not designed to get justice. It's designed to use the lawsuit itself as a weapon of attack to silence advocacy. In other words, if somebody is advocating in their community against a big company that's, say, polluting a creek or a stream, and they get hit with a lawsuit and they have no money to hire a lawyer and they're facing bankruptcy from this lawsuit, they're likely to just stop advocating. Right. And you know, the, the, the company knows they can never get money from that person. I mean, I have, you know, I don't have any money. Um, they've taken it all, but I never had much to begin with. I'm a human rights lawyer. So why would a giant oil company that, that has 250 billion U.S. in revenue annually want to sue someone with no money? Well, it's not about the money. It's not about justice. It's about trying to abuse the legal process to deny people's free speech rights. That's a slap lawsuit. One of the things that really I found troubling in the 90s, particularly after the Shell Sarawiwa, um, stuff happened. You may remember there was this term that started being used about 96, 97, corporate social responsibility. And it's still used, you know. And more and more I think about it, I think that there's a huge problem. And I think we need to get moved totally away from that idea of corporate social responsibility. CSR. CSR. Because what that does is it essentially lets corporations off the hook. If you think about it, in a large organization like an oil company, if you have a CSR department, that takes away almost all of your responsibility <laughs> if you're out right. in the field in, yeah. in Nigeria. Because you think, oh, well, the CSR people, they're, 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 looking sort of, they're doing the ethics. We don't have to worry about it. So what do you want and to replace it with? I want to replace it with, I think people should be held individually accountable for the actions they take in corporations. I mean, I've got minutes of shell meetings at the time that Sarawi was executed. I know the names of all of those people who were at those meetings the day before. And those people one day will be in The Hague. Those people one day will be being held individually responsible for their corporate crimes. And that's absolutely as it should be. So Stephen, here Dan is referring to the Ken Sarawiwa case. He was the leader of the resistance struggle against the devastation that Shell uh, was causing in Nigeria at the time, in the 90s. Uh, Shell effectively worked with the Nigerian military dictatorship um, to frame Sarawiwa, uh, and he was executed in 1995. When we look at the uh, parallels between what's happened uh, there uh, in uh, the 90s and what's happened in Ecuador, which you brought to light, there are a fair few uh, bits of crossover here, aren't there? I think this is a playbook used by corporations in the fossil fuel industry that has been around for a long time. I mean, it, it has different characteristics depending on the situation. You know, it's harder to execute a guy like me in New York than to you know, do what was done to Ken Sarawiwa in Nigeria in the mid 90s. But you know, the effect, or I should say the objective is the same, which is to intimidate people into not doing this kind of work and to really obtain some degree of impunity for corporate human rights violators. People hearing this now want to put pressure on Chevron and others uh, to say you have to stop doing this immediately. How do they begin to do that? How do they begin to get their voice heard? Well, you know, this is a, a battle that 
is probably the most important battle in the world today, which is about how do we deal with the fossil fuel industry so we can save our planet and create a sustainable economy. This case is a one flashpoint in, a, in this larger battle, but make no mistake, I mean, case legal cases like this where lawyers and campaigners try to hold you know, fossil fuel companies accountable for their pollution are absolutely critical. It's important people rally to the cause and do whatever they can in whatever way they can in their communities and more broadly. I think in terms of our case, we need help. This is a paradigmatic case. This is the most important corporate accountability case in the world today. It is the most important climate justice litigation over pollution in the world today. So, you know, we ask to, for people to join our campaign. There's a website called donzigerdefense.com. So we need people's help. You know, the Ecuadorian communities need the support of the world. Please go on that website. You can do one of three things. You can see articles and learn more about the case. You can donate funds to our defense fund, which pays for some of the legal expenses as well as our living expenses so me and my family can survive this because I can't work and they took all my money. And you can also sign up to our campaign where we send out periodic emails asking people to take action. Separately, there's a website called makechevroncleanup.com and that's the website maintained by the affected communities in Ecuador in the United States. It's in English and you can also sign up for the campaign and take action via that website. Finally, I mentioned Aaron Brockovich uh, right at the top. Who would you like to direct the eight-part series of this tale? Because let's face it, you can't get more cinematic, televisual, dramatic, and David and Goliath than this. That's a good question. You know, it's, it's interesting you ask that. I mean, I think this story needs to get out any way it can. I don't want people to think like this is like a Hollywood thing. And I know you sort of asked that question tongue in cheek, but I do think the story needs to get out. I do think the story needs to be told. It's, a, it's an epic story about struggle by indigenous peoples and a team of international lawyers in a unit that's never been seen before. It's about incredibly courageous donors who have funded this case. It's an extraordinary story. It does deserve a wider telling, and I think it would make a great script. The director, I'll sort of, I'll leave that to the experts. There's a lot of great directors I admire who I think would do a great job. Stephen Donziger, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it.